And hello, welcome. This is Mr. Shulman, and in this short little video, we are going to look at how the United States makes foreign and military policy. Well, really, what we're going to look at is just some of the basics of what we mean by foreign and military policy and a couple of the underlying philosophies that exist that you should be aware of as we analyze foreign policy situations. I like this image right here because it does a nice job breaking down three big components of foreign policy the United States has. There's the diplomacy side, the trade side, as well as the security side. And a lot of times I've found students like to focus solely on the security, the, the military, the CIA, the, the spying stuff, a lot of the stuff that gets a lot of attention in the media. But I would argue that the diplomacy and trade are also quite important. And in fact, we often as a country try to resolve our conflicts more through uh, diplomacy, through negotiations, as well as using trade um, both as a carrot and then also as a stick to get to motivate other countries to work with us. So as we go through this, just keep those in mind. All right, here we go. So in this short video, as well as as we look at the foreign policy concept, as, as we've done in domestic and economic policy, you should be internally connecting how these lessons are connected to topics we have studied throughout the year. Uh, here you're going to see connections to the Constitution, checks and balances, separation of powers, uh, ideology, opinion, as well as the roles of Congress, the presidency, and bureaucracy. All right, so let's start here first. Just a quick little history lesson about the United States. Um, in the early days of our country, and as you've read George Washington's farewell address, we were a country that promoted isolationism, meaning that the United States really, for the most part, stayed out of foreign affairs. Um, I would argue this, this timeline here says we did this from 1783 to 1917. We were involved. I mean, we, we did, you know, take over. We did fight Mexico in the 1840s. We were involved in the Spanish-American War in the late 1890s. However, for the most part, we kind of, you know, did our own thing. We stayed away from other countries. We were trying to, you know, get ourselves together, kind of help ourselves develop. And then since the end of World War I with the development of the League of Nations, which we did not partake in, but that's a whole other issue, um, the United States has been involved in international affairs. Um, and so this is often called interventionism, the idea that the United States is involved, they do play a role, but that role has changed. It is different, as you can see, depending upon the time period. All right. Um, this is kind of cool. This is rather timely. So if you look at this poll, this is from the Pew Research Center uh, from March 2014. You know Pew, tons of ethos, very credible, nonpartisan. Uh, they asked the question, what is uh, more important for the U.S. to do in terms of the conflict with Russia and, and the whole Ukrainian situation? And as you can see, the biggest chunk here, say 56%, say that the United States should not get too involved in the situation. 29% say the government should take a firm stand against Russian actions. And then you have a pretty sizable chunk here, 15% that say they don't know. Now, really simple, but according to this poll, do you think the American public at this point in time had an isolationist or an interventionist foreign policy attitude? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple, but as you can see, I mean, for 56% of the country to say, do not get involved at all, um, that's a pretty isolationist approach. And we've seen hints of this, you know, for, for many, many years, even though According to this timeline, we've been involved in, you know, world affairs going back to World War I. We have ebbs and flows of the United States public wanting the government to be involved and not involved. Um, we'll talk more about this data in class. If you have any questions, let me know. All right, so let's get into what we mean by foreign policy. Foreign policy, quite simply, 
is how the United States interacts with other countries in the world. Uh, the idea here of foreign, meaning you're, you're working with other countries, is the opposite of domestic, where you're focusing on your own country. Uh, here are some of the big tools, some of the big things we use to help conduct our foreign policy. And I mentioned this before, but diplomacy, uh, negotiating, communicating with other countries, whether they are our friends, our allies, or you know anybody in the middle, uh, diplomacy plays a huge role. Um, economic aid. We give out a lot of money uh, in terms of grants, loans, and other credits, uh, as well as um, you know materials to countries to help them you know develop, to help them get going after a, maybe a natural disaster or after a war. We do those things, you know. To help the country, or maybe to you know help them from becoming a dictatorship, or to help keep them uh, on in good favors with us. Next, we have uh, technical assistance, where we do as well as economic aid. We do send a lot of our specialists, whether they're government specialists or even people working in uh, non-government organizations. Uh, we do work with them to kind of send experts into other countries, mostly developing nations, to help them, you know, jumpstart their agricultural industries, engineering, businesses. Uh, you look at Afghanistan, where we did spend a lot of money uh, fighting, you know, the military side, but we did spend millions, if not billions of dollars, helping Afghanistan develop uh, farming, helping them create infrastructure, and really helping them create a brand new country. A popular concept um, that comes in the news a lot are economic sanctions, or sanctions of any kind. And I love this cartoon because it kind of does a silly job of, of showing you what sanctions mean. Um, there are many different types of sanctions that exist. Some of the biggest ones that you've seen historically are boycotts, when countries refuse to trade with someone else. Uh, for instance, the United States. We have had sanctions against Cuba going back to the 1950s and 60s because uh, with the revolution and Castro turning Cuba into a communist country. The United States did not like that, and so trade between our countries is very limited. It's very hard to travel there. You can't really send stuff there uh, legally. So that is meant to punish countries who do things that we don't like as a country. And then fighting, military, um, very controversial. As you know, there are you know, <laughs> conflicts and, you know, which part of our government is responsible for using the military? Is, should the president have to ask Congress all the time? Should Congress be the one declaring war? Um, so it gets a lot of attention in the news, in television, in movies, but we really do try to fight um, as a last resort. As you look at these different goals, these different tools, what you want to do is keep in mind how the different bureaucratic agencies we've studied are involved and you should go back and look at some of those agencies and which ones might be involved in helping the United States government promote these tools. Take a look here. This is a uh, Pew Research poll from 2013, March 22nd, 2013 and very simple question. Uh, should we pay less attention to problems overseas, concentrate on problems here at home? And what's interesting, you go back to 1992 to 2012, so you've got you know a good 20-year um, window here. For the most part, Americans tend to agree with this statement, meaning that we should pay less attention to the problems overseas very isolationist tone here. However, as you'll note, it does dip a little bit around the 2002 era, and as you know, American history, that is right around the beginnings of the wars in Afghanistan after 9-11, so it does ebb and flow a little bit. Alright, take a look at this cartoon here. This is uh, one of my favorites, and, and this one takes a little bit of thinking uh, to understand. So let's break it down here. It says up here, transportation policy, okay? B gets energy policy. B gets foreign policy. Now, if you want to figure it out, you might as well pause it now. So let me explain what I think it means. 
So we have a domestic transportation policy, and according to this cartoonist, our transportation policy emphasizes cars rather than mass transit, like trains. Because of our transportation policy, this cartoonist thinks that our domestic policy creates our energy policy, the begets. So because we focus so much on cars, we use a lot of oil. And according to this cartoonist, oil isn't the best product for our environment. And because we use lots of oil, according to this cartoonist, it promotes our foreign policy. And one of the arguments that many detractors of the Iraq War argued was that one of the reasons the United States went in was to acquire more oil. So you take this cartoon, once again, this is the cartoonist's opinion, the domestic policies of our transportation helped us create our foreign policy. I don't put this in here to try to brainwash you. I put this in here to show you that domestic and foreign policy aren't always separated. They do have interlocking connections. All right, the last thing I want to go over with you is something, one of my favorite things I studied when I was a college student, the different types of international relations or IR philosophies. I'm going over the two basic ones. There are many more. You can take uh, courses on these things. You can, you know, spend many years studying these. This is just, you know, basic introduction. Let's start with idealism. Idealism, political idealism, and you've probably seen this word idealism before. The idea here is that the government, the U.S. government, we'll use for our example here, should use its internal political philosophies as a goal of its foreign policy. So think about some of the internal, um, what, are, what are some of the characteristics of U.S. political philosophy? Political participation, democracy, voting, uh, minority rights, equal opportunity, you know, the list goes on. The idea of idealism is that we should use our internal, our domestic characteristics as the, the vehicle as the impetus for making our foreign policy. So if we believe in democracy, we should promote democracy. If we believe in helping minorities, we should promote that in other countries. Now, the opposite of that is something called political realism. And the idea here is that instead of using our internal philosophy to guide our foreign policy, we should promote foreign policy that helps us militarily, economically, rather than relying on our ideals or ethics. This is often referred to as the philosophy of real politik. It's a German word, it's not a misspelling. And our, I would argue, the United States foreign policy has been a mixture. Um, going back many, many years. Um, you know, when presidents give big speeches, often State of the Union addresses, they do like to promote how the United States is helping shine a light on the world, giving them some hope and how other countries can act um, in terms of having fair elections and yada, yada, yada. But on the other hand, we do work with other countries we may not agree with internally. We do, we have traded with countries and participated in actions that many people might not find very, very satisfying. Take a look at this image right here. You'll notice how this man on the right, his face hasn't changed very much. He's just gotten older. On the left, these are all American presidents going back to Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, Republican. George H. Bush, Republican. Bill Clinton, Democrat. George W. Bush, Republican. Barack Obama, Democrat. This guy right here, former Egyptian president, or many would call dictator, Hosni Mubarak. Didn't have fair elections, ruled with an iron fist, and yet we have had, we had friendly relations with him for many years, going back many different political parties. Why? Well, it wasn't because Mubarak was promoting fairness and democracy. It was because of the idea of real politics. He was promoting military stability in the Middle East. 
uh, for this time period, um, one of our allies, Israel, was relatively safe. Um, Egypt was not um, creating havoc in the region. It created a relatively stable atmosphere. Goes to the question, should the United States promote idealism? Should we promote realism? Or should we have a mixture of the two? As I said before, here's Barack Obama shaking hands with Hosni Mubarak. All right. You should be able to figure out how this emphasizes the concept of realism or real politic. Now take a look at this image here. Do you recognize who this guy is? That is former Iraqi president or dictator Saddam Hussein. You might not know who that is. That is former Defense Secretary, U.S. Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld. And look at what they're doing. They're shaking hands. That's because in the 1980s, we actually worked with the Iraqi government to help them fight against Iran. We knew that Saddam Hussein wasn't very nice to his people and that he had gassed some of his own people, yet we were willing to work with him in order to fight another enemy we had, Iran. Should the United States have worked with Saddam Hussein? That's a question you would have to answer. The irony is, is what did we do in 2003? We fought, we spent money to depose this man who, in this picture, we were friends with. Hmm, American foreign policy. Crazy, ain't it? All right, I'll give you this slide here, and this is just something for you to ponder. The United States government, we do a ton of business with China. We have a lot of companies that sell products to China. China has companies that sell products here. China, though, has a history of not treating its citizens equally, of depriving people of human rights. What would you do? Would you allow companies to trade with China? Would you stop companies tr trading with chain, uh, trading with China? Um, what would be the idealistic point of view? What would be the realistic point of view? All right. Well, I hope as we went through this very short video <laughs> um, that you were able to connect a lot of these different concepts to uh, what we were learning about. I know I didn't get too much into the U.S. Constitution, but in the following assignments you will see how the Constitution you know, uh, differentiates the different powers, the foreign policy powers of the Congress and the President, as well as checks and balances. As you know, if you have any questions at all, do not hesitate to email me. Adios.